Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you to thank you for coming to tonight's meeting. We'll be talking about the City of Burlingame's housing element. So it's just six o'clock. Uh, we appreciate you being on time for a prompt start. So we are just going to get started. I'm going to turn it over now to Kevin Gardner, the Community Development Director for the City of Burlingame, to get us started. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Gardiner, and uh, as uh, Joan mentioned, I am the Community Development Director for the City of Burlingame. And then with me also this evening from our staff is Ruben Huron, who is our Planning Manager, uh, Joseph Sanfilippo, who is our Economic Development and Housing Specialist, and Fazia Ali, uh, who is our Assistant Planner and has been working with us on the outreach for the Housing Element Update. So really appreciate you all taking the time. I know uh, lots of things are going on and the sun is shining. It's a beautiful evening, and uh, but, but we're glad that you're interested in housing in Burlingame. Um, I do want to also acknowledge I uh, 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 see Council Member Brownrigg is here. So uh, thank you, Council Member, for joining us this evening. And uh, we appreciate you uh, joining the community in this discussion. And with that, I will hand it back over to Joan from MIG. Okay. Thanks, everyone. My name is Joan Chaplick. I'm with MIG, and we're a consulting firm that is helping the city do some outreach. Um, and I'll be serving as the facilitator for tonight's meeting. So for our agenda, um, we're going to take a moment and describe to you the different ways you can participate in tonight's meeting. Then that's going to be followed by a presentation on the housing element. So first, we want to give you some context related to housing in Burlingame, and then you're going to hear more in depth about the requirements and the planning process for the housing element. And then the bulk of the time is going to be spent on community input. And we're going to want to hear from you about your issues, your concerns, and your ideas, ideas for housing sites, ideas for programs. And also, we have time reserved at the end for public comment. So we're going to be using some digital tools throughout the meeting. Um, we're going to have some polling questions. So getting started, we just have a couple of demographic questions. It helps us understand who we've been able to reach. Then you can use the chat. And we'd love you to submit your comments and questions. So we'll be stopping throughout the presentation to answer, answer any questions you have or clarify any, any comments or information that is shared. Um, and then again, we'll have you'll be able to speak verbally during public comment. Um, here's our Zoom controls that we'll be using tonight. Um, you'll be able to, when, it's, when you're called on to speak, you'll be able to unmute or show your video. Um, we'll be spending a lot of time in the chat. And when we get to public comment, you can raise your hand and we'll be able to call on you. So those are our basic Zoom tools. And we're going to start by testing out the chat. So we'd love if you would just take a moment and take, take one word that, that describes what you like about living in Burlingame. So just drop that in the chat. And it'll give us a little bit of flavor. And if you don't live in Burlingame, but you'd like to, or you currently work in Burlingame, um, we welcome your answer to that question as well. So we'll give folks a, a minute to type their responses. Okay, let's see here. Oh, we have, uh, we have a couple coming in. Okay, uh, we have economic opportunity, inclusive, weather, and especially today, beautiful weather going on there today. So great. So just, you know, a couple of thoughts to get us started and also to confirm that the chat works. So we're pleased that you participated there. Um, we do have some polling questions. So um, we have five polling questions just to give us a little bit of information about who's on the line here. And my colleague, Joey Nielsen, is going to activate the polls. So um, you'll see that, and if you can just um, pick your response to the polling questions as we move through them. So uh, Joey, let's get our first polling question up. And Joan, I'll add that this is anonymous, so this is just for us to have a sense of who's here and then also report as we uh, summarize our outreach, um, mm -hmm. who's in attendance at these meetings. Okay, and let's see. 
I'm going to see where my first polling question is. Okay. Oh, I know. Um, let's see, Joey, are we having a, there it is. There's our first polling question. So um, how long have you lived in Burlingame? So let us know if it's less than a year, one to five years, five to 10 years, or 10 years or more. And I know we have, a, we have a small group tonight, but we do want to collect the information and make sure that you get all everything that we have planned in tonight's meeting. Okay, so we'll, um, I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. So let's, uh, let's just share the results um, as we would with a larger group. So we have one newcomer and uh, one longer term resident. Okay, let's go to our second question. So, uh, Joey, let's pull up our next question of, do you work in Burlingame? So we're seeking to find out if you work in Burlingame or no, if you work outside the city, or if you're retired, you might be a student, um, does not apply. So we'll have that question in just a moment. Okay, there it is. Okay, so we have we have uh, one person who works in Berlin game, and someone that it doesn't apply to. Okay, now, uh, a third person. Okay, another person it doesn't apply to as well. So let's wrap up our second polling question, and we'll move on to the third. So let's see. So for our third question, um, we'd like to know about your housing situation. So are you a homeowner? Do you rent your home? Do you live with family or friends? Or do you currently not have a permanent home? So and we'll have our polling question up in just a moment. Now we appreciate your patience with technology. There it is. Okay, so let us know. Are you an owner? someone who rents, living with family or friends, or you don't have a permanent home. Okay, so that's our third question. And let's share those results. Okay, and now we're gonna move to our fourth polling question. And what is your age? So we like to see who our outreach brings in. And Kevin said it's anonymous. So uh, let us know, are you under 18, between 18 and 29? between 30 and 49, or between 50 and 64, or 65 and over. So we'll have that polling question in just a moment. And we can, we can see, see what our age range is. Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay. So we have we have some some major age groups represented here in the meeting. Thank you. Okay. And then we're going to go to our last our last polling question, and this is just a little bit of demographic information. Um, the The plans are approved by the state, and it helps if we're able to communicate uh, who we have been able to reach through our outreach. So when the question comes up, we'll ask you if you're, uh, if you would like to answer the question to identify your race and ethnicity. And uh, while that question is coming up, um, we'd love to know um, what outreach tool reached you. So how did you find out about tonight's meeting? If you could drop that in the chat and uh, if you could give me that answer and then the polling question will just be up and uh, We'll have that in a moment. And this is our fifth polling question. It's the final one as well. So let's see, I'm seeing in the chat that, okay, people uh, from the, our email, the email outreach work team, and then also the farmer's market. And um, I think that name sounds familiar. I may have spoken to you Sunday morning. So I'm glad you were able to come tonight. 
and uh, just a, another, there's our polling question. So if you care to share with us your race and ethnicity, we'd appreciate that. And again, it, it helps the city uh, document and communicate who we were able to reach. So let's share the results. And okay, so um, we have a, a good group with us tonight, a small but mighty, and you will get the full show. So um, our first speaker is Ruben Hurin. He's the planning manager. And Ruben is going to set the stage for us in terms of housing in Burlingame. So Ruben, take it away. Great. Thanks, Joan. And I also wanted to thank everyone for uh, joining us this evening. Um, this evening, I just wanted to share a little bit about Burlingame's context. So first, let's take a look at uh, who lives here. Uh, so based on the U.S. Census, Burlingame's total population in 2019 was approximately 30,576 uh, persons. It's been fairly steady over the years, but it has been gradually increasing since the 1980s. Okay. Oh, and I just want to share, we have a student uh, who's was in an urban planning class and her professor talked about this meeting. So glad that she is here with us. Okay, Ruben. Great. I was just so excited to hear that. So no, sorry that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so the median uh, age in Burlingame is 40.1. Almost half or 46% of our residents are between 25 and 54 years old. And 18% are children attending elementary, middle or high school. Burlingame's uh, racial composition is 53.3% white, 27.7% Asian, Pacific Islander, uh, almost 13% Hispanic Latino, 1.2% Black, 0.1% uh, Native American, and 7% where more than one race was reported. As we all know, the cost of living is high in San Mateo County and Burlingame. Uh, which is reflective of the income needed to live here. Burlingame's median household income is $128,447, with just a little over half of its households earning more than $100,000. But also important to note is that one quarter of our households have a median income of less than $50,000, which is why it's so important to look for opportunities to provide affordable housing options for all income levels. You may not realize it, but more than half of the homes in Burlingame are multifamily, which include duplexes, apartments, condominiums. This portion, a proportion is pretty rare in the Bay Area as single family homes take up a majority of home types in most suburban communities. You may also be surprised that there are more renters and homeowners in Burlingame, uh, which is reflective of the home types we saw in the last slide. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's look at who works here. So approximately 33,500 persons work in Burlingame, which interestingly, it almost matches our population. Uh, retail, automobile sales, hotels, light industrial, office and healthcare industries are its major employers. Of the th employees working in Burlingame, roughly 39% earn $40,000 a year or less or approximately $3,333 a month. So for the barista at your favorite coffee shop, waiter or house cleaner, it would be challenging, if not impossible, to work and live in Burlingame. One of the goals of the housing element is to establish programs or policies that would make it possible for all income levels to live in Burlingame. There are several planning initiatives that have been completed or are in process. Burlingame adopted its current housing element in 2015 for an eight year cycle. We are now working on the next update to be adopted by January of 2023, which would take us to 2031. In March of 2015, the city of Burlingame initiated a multi year um, process to update the city's general plan, which we call Envision Burlingame. The city council adopted the general plan and certified the accompanying environmental impact report in January of 2019. 
The general plan accommodates an additional 2,951 housing units, mostly in the north end of Burlingame near the Millbury BART and Caltrain station and along the multi-unit residential corridor along El Camino Real. This means that Burlingame is well positioned to accommodate opportunities for housing in the next housing element and no significant changes will be required to do so. In conjunction with the general plan, the city adopted zoning standards for the North Rollins Road area, again, which is uh, in the north part of Burlingame near Millbury. And we are currently in the process of preparing the North Rollins Road specific plan. The objective of the specific plan is to provide the framework for this new neighborhood where residents and businesses have ready access to transit, supportive commercial businesses, and public and private open spaces. So that concludes uh, the context portion. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or turn it back over to Joan. Okay, thank you, Ruben. So any questions? Um, I think uh, Ruben, Ruben gave us some good information to set the stage for this planning process in terms of the number of people, the type of housing you have and are, are likely to need. Uh, do we have any, any comments or questions? Um, well, you know, we are using the chat, but because we're such a small group, um, Janet, I think we're going to just have you ask your question verbally. So um, we're going to let you unmute and why don't you go ahead? Great, thank you. Um, that was an outstanding summary. Thank you so much. Um, my question is um, of the housing that, that Burlingame developed in this housing element period that's ending. Do you know how much of the housing was affordable to people at the extremely low income level? Um, have you been able to produce housing for that level of income? I, uh, so uh, you're asking about the uh, projects that have actually have been built in Burlingame. Uh, so I don't think we have any that are extremely low. Uh, most of them are uh, either moderate income. We have had some recent approvals uh, where we get into the low income or very low income. Um, but not with the extremely low income. Uh, so that's something that we can certainly look at when we look at policies and programs uh, moving forward in this next cycle. And, and uh, Janet, there's going to be some information about what's coming up in this housing element in the next section that Kevin's going to speak to. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, there'll be plenty of time to get them answered. So how about if we continue? And now um, Kevin Gardner, uh, the Community Development Director is gonna walk us through the, the housing element. Great, thank you, Joan. So uh, the housing element is an element of the Burlingame General Plan. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what general plan is, it's, it's basically the master plan for a city it charts out um, what does the city want to be doing over the next 10, 20, 30 years. In this case, it's a plan to take the city to 2040. Uh, a big piece of the general plan update was to look at housing and in particular, you know, how, much, how big should the city grow? How many people should be living there um, in addition to who's there now? And um, how many people might be working there? Um, one thing that we asked when we started the process are um, are there elements of the city or places in town that you really love and would like to not see a lot of changes and, and really kind of protect? And then are there areas where you would like to see some changes? Maybe you see some opportunity, maybe there's room for improvement. So um, in a broad summary, what we heard is people love the city's neighborhoods, um, the, uh, particularly the residential neighborhoods. Um, the, the housing stock is varied. Um, there's um, a lot of older homes that are really beautiful, beautiful trees, tree-lined streets, um, walkability to uh, the commercial districts. And people really didn't want to see a lot of changes to those areas just in terms of, of uh, the kinds of development or the character of, of development. On the other hand, what you see on this map are uh, these areas that are colored in, in different colors. These were areas that people thought, you know, I think maybe there are, there are some changes we'd like to see. There's, there's maybe some opportunities. Um, downtown is one area where I would say people kind of had the, 
mixed opinions. People love downtown and they love what it's doing, but they also see some opportunity um, and particularly maybe adding more housing downtown so that uh, more people can enjoy that proximity to all the businesses and restaurants and everything. Uh, El Camino Real, um, and I think we heard from, um, we had a pop-up event on uh, at the, as Joan mentioned, at the Fresh Market on Sunday, and some people mentioned they could imagine um, some improvements to El Camino Real. Some of it relates to the street itself, and that includes the paving and the trees and the uh, broken sidewalks and things. And, and the good news is there is a plan in place to address the physical aspects of the roadway itself. But we also saw that as an opportunity. Um, what's interesting in Burlingame uh, compared to other peninsula communities is El Camino Real is entirely residential uh, with the exception of, of a stretch in downtown and a very little bit in Broadway, um, at least until you get to the northern end of town. So uh, if you go to the other communities, they're entirely commercial. It's really known as a commercial corridor. Burlingame's unique in that it's a um, residential corridor. And it's also um, a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat at the same time I'm talking, so um, I, will, I will get to that point as well. Um, and, and El Camino Real is, uh, it's also where a lot of, of apartment buildings are. So uh, Ruben mentioned the proportion of rentals to um, ownership housing, and a lot of the rentals are right along El Camino Real. Not uh, coincidentally, it's also where there's a lot of transit. There's a, a high quality bus corridor uh, that serves the residents on El Camino Real. Moving up the map, we heard interest in what we call North Burlingame, and that's the area around Burlingame Plaza, and it's within walking distance of the BART station in Millbrae. It includes the, the um, hospital medical center, but also the Burlingame Plaza, office buildings across the street, um, and, and um, it really does have a different character than the other part of El Camino Real, and people thought that there's some great opportunity there. Rollins Road, as, as Ruben mentioned, um, there's interest in, and there's really kind of two pieces to Rollins Road. There's the industrial character that exists now, and, and that works very well. There's, um, it's a very productive industrial area. So uh, the thought was to leave a portion of that area as industry and, and really adapt it to new types of industry. For example, there's an electric bus uh, manufacturer on, uh, on uh, uh, Rollins Road, which is very exciting. So there's some new technology, but at the Northern end, and again, within walking distance of the BART station in Millbrae, um, we saw an opportunity or the community really saw an opportunity for what we call the live work zone. Um, and I think live work, that term is meant to convey that there's employment and industry coexisting with residents. So it's not changing it into a residential neighborhood. It's allowing this kind of funky mix of, uh, you know, if you've been to, uh, for example, Dog Patch in San Francisco is, is very trendy these days, and we see a lot of similarities there. If you've been to Santa Barbara, the funk zone. Um, so it's, it's kind of something altogether different in Burlingame, and, and we hope that that would become a neighborhood of choice uh, for people that really like that mix. And then the Bayfront is another area that we heard people saw a lot of opportunity for changes. Um, however, we also... Um, through the city council, through the planning commission, through the whole process decided that's maybe not the best place for housing at this point in time. Uh, the idea was to really focus the housing opportunities more where there's existing transportation, existing services and shops and schools. Um, and, and the Bayfront is really, it's an employment and hotel and uh, it, it's much more of a commercial area sort of uh, set apart from the rest of the city. Tremendous opportunity, but maybe not for housing. Next, please. So what are our achievements and accomplishments? And uh, one thing we want to mention, um, so this is in our, our existing housing element. Um, our, um, we'll get to this term, RENA, or Regional Housing Needs Allocation, but uh, the state tells each jurisdiction how many housing units it should be planning for and setting aside land and zoning um, in each eight year cycle. Um, in this last cycle, um, under um, going up until this, this is the last year of that cycle, uh, the city was asked to provide uh, capacity for 863 units. Um, as you can see, we've um, already exceeded that 
um, well in advance. Um, there are currently 1,918 units that have either been approved or are under construction. Of those, 308 are, um, or 16% are designated as affordable. Um, as Ruben mentioned, they're either to moderate, low. Um, we have started getting into the very low income categories. And I think we have a slide coming up to talk about the city's uh, Village of Burlingame project, which has really been able to, to change the news on that. And there are um, still 1,228 additional units under review or in pre-submittal, which pre-submittal means we're, we're aware of the project. It hasn't been submitted, but it's been shown somewhere. It's had a community meeting or been in the news or something. And 20% of those would be affordable as, as currently proposed. Good news is a lot of these roll over. So um, as much as we'll talk about what our new number is that we're aiming towards, um, anything that's not, that's under construction or um, been approved and not yet built, uh, we do get credit for that. So, um, and, and really the point is to provide the housing, whether it's, you know, in this cycle or, or the next, the point is that these are homes for people to live in. Next, please. So as mentioned, and I appreciate the uh, prompt from uh, Council Member Brownrigg, uh, the village of Burlingame really is a big deal. Um, until this project, uh, the city was just kind of starting, I, you know, lots of sincere efforts to get um, affordable units, but it is very hard to get affordable units to work in a market rate development without the city intervening. So in this case, uh, the village of Burlingame, yes, um, and I think Ruben is providing a a link there or, or sorry this. no I, I i started to give some facts um maybe uh, quickly uh 12 um so it's it's like kevin mentioned workforce and senior 12 of the units are uh would be available for incomes up to 50 percent of the area median income and 108 uh, would be up to 60 percent. so we're in that you know very low category great and the way this worked is the city uh, took one of its city parking lots and uh, basically donated it, not, not technically. There, of course, was a, a rather complex deal to make it all work, but provided the land at no cost, which was really the, uh, it works as a subsidy, which made the development possible. And uh, the parking was also relocated. Parking is important <laughs> downtown Burlingame. It, it really uh, kind of keeps things going. So um, as many of you may be aware, there's a new parking structure right across the street from this development. And that not only replaces the parking that was on the, this parking lot, but also provides um, additional parking to service into the future. Uh, there's also a city park, which is available not just to the residents here at the village, but also to anyone that's in the neighborhood. It's a, it's a pocket park and we'll take any opportunity to increase the uh, number of, of parks in the city. Next, please. So looking at, and this is, is, this is where we start. Um, we've done a little bit of community engagement. Some of you may be participated in some meetings in the fall that were uh, led by the county. And then we've had some study sessions and, and meetings with the city council and planning commission. So we're, we're kind of taking a first guess at where we think we're going. Um, we do want to mention that commercial linkage fees and residential impact fees were adopted in 2017 and 2019. Um, those are technical words for basically their impact fees. Um, they're, a commercial linkage fee is assessed on new commercial development. So for example, a new office building um, will be assessed a fee that is to take account for the impact that building will have on the housing supply and, and in particular needing to build more affordable housing. And then residential impact fees are um, very similar. They are assessed on new residential developments, but also have the option in lieu of paying fees, they can provide the units on site at um, either moderate, low or very low income categories. And um, the good news is we've had a lot of developments take that option. So that means a lot of units are under construction now and will be coming online in the next few years. Um, as a thanks to those, those fees. There is room for improvement. And um, as was mentioned, I, I think we are, we're interested in increasing the percentage of affordable units in new developments, or at least looking to see our, you know, our, should we be asking more? Is, is there more room? 
um, and possibly getting uh, to deeper levels of affordability, getting into that extremely low income category. Um, and then also there's been a lot of interest in preserving the term is naturally affordable units. And first of all, affordable is all relative. We know it's you know affordable to somebody, maybe not everybody. Um, but a lot of the older housing stock in particular in Burlingame, uh, the rents are below what market rents would be in a brand new building somewhere else on the peninsula or in town. So um, there's interest in not losing those units and, and ensuring that maybe they can stay in that they're probably in that moderate income category um, and they, they serve an important role in the community. So uh, we've been thinking about programs that uh, might be able to preserve some of those uh, naturally affordable units. Next, please. So these are the numbers and as mentioned, the regional housing needs allocation, um, it's RHNA and is pronounced RENA um, in, in lingo. So when people talk about RENA, that's what they're talking about. And it's not just the total number. So as much as we kind of look at the headline and say, these are the number of units that are under construction, we do also want to look at the allocation to very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income categories. And um, part of the, the assignments come based off of our employment base. So as Ruben mentioned, um, we do have a sizable employment base. Um, that would be in the um, low and very low income categories. Um, these are the service jobs, the baristas, the, the people that you see every day, um, perhaps even yourselves. And, um, and we value uh, finding homes for, for everybody in the community. Um, so we want to, uh, so that's part of our allocation and we really wanna look at that sincerely and, and find ways to, to serve all of these income categories. Uh, the increase in units is, substantial from the last cycle to the new cycle. Uh, as mentioned, the um, last cycle, which was um, from 2015 to this year, uh, we were required to provide capacity for 863 new units. In the next eight year cycle, uh, it's 3,257. So that's a big jump. Um, Burlingame is not alone. This is a regional issue. And um, I think that's, that's kind of an over, uh, big theme with, with a lot of this is, um, as we often will hear in the news, the state uh, needs a lot more housing, the region needs a lot of housing, uh, there's a lot of job creation, um, particularly in San Mateo County, it's, it's a very vibrant economy, and with that comes people with jobs and people needing somewhere to live, and ideally not having to commute from very far distances. So uh, like all of our neighboring jurisdictions, our allocations have gone up. The good news is our general plan just about covers these 3,257 units. So um, kudos to the community for, for having that foresight, looking at those change areas and saying, we do imagine some changes and that can include a lot of new housing. And the good news is it's, it's right in line with what the state um, would be asking us to do. Next, please. So our goals for starters, and these are preliminary goals. These are based on what we've heard to date, but this is not to say that we've already written the housing element. We have not. <laughs> so we wanna hear from the community and, and say, this is what we're thinking, but what do you think of this? And uh, what are things we have not mentioned? So we do wanna meet housing that meets the needs of the community and the workforce. Um, uh, the good news, as mentioned, is the general plan has provided ample capacity, so we don't have to rezone. Um, it's not to say that somebody might say, I don't know, maybe we should look at this area or this, you know, do something different. It is on the table, but we don't have to. Other communities, I know, are having a much harder time and really trying to figure out where are they going to put these couple thousand units or, or whatever their requirement is. And, and the good news is we've, we've done that hard work already. Um, we do want housing that is affordable to the city's workforce, and um, this is something we're making great gains on. Um, it's, uh, I think, adopting these uh, impact fees that were adopted uh, a few years ago really did change the, the game on that and has allowed um, a lot of progress um, in a pretty short amount of time, but that we know that there is uh, work to be done as well. And with those funds being collected, we want to think about what is the most effective use of those housing funds, as well as city resources. 
um, we see thinking of that village at Burlingame affordable housing development on a city parking lot. Um, we hope that is successful and could be a example for there's a lot more parking lots in Burlingame and uh, it would be great if we could get more of those affordable units. It, it uh, hopefully is a success. It seems like it will be and, and uh, perhaps it's, a, it's an example for more. Um, and then what can we do with those housing funds? Can that be used to subsidize uh, lower income units? Uh, can it be used to preserve units that are already relatively affordable? Um, that's something we wanna be looking at with either the housing element or as we implement the housing element in the future years. Next, please. So our progress is um, we've, there has been a lot of studies going on in the background starting in January of 2021. Um, a lot of the demographic information. Um, there is also a uh, component of the new housing element called affirmatively furthering fair housing. So we've been looking at a lot of the demographics related to that to really have a sense of what kinds of policies and directions, um, what should the city be doing in order to really um, provide more fair housing opportunities for everybody. Um, possibly look at patterns and see what patterns are um, need to be changed so that there are more opportunities and um, for, for more more households in Burlingame. We're in the uh, public outreach piece right now. So um, we did start some meetings uh, as part of a county effort last fall, and now we're doing the city of Burlingame meetings. This is the first of two, and then we have also had those. Uh, pop-up meetings that, that uh, Joan had described. From here, uh, we have a joint City Council Planning Commission meeting at the end of April that we will be reporting back on the outreach that we've done with our housing element and sharing the different ideas that we're, we'll be hearing from all of you. And then um, we turn in a draft to the state and ideally have something ready to be adopted by the end of this calendar year. Next, please. Okay, so, well, thank you, Kevin. So questions, any, any questions on the, the presentation? I think between uh, Ruben and Kevin's information that um, you have a pretty good overview of the planning context. Um, okay, I have a hand up. Um, Elizabeth, let's, let's um, we're a small group. Let's, uh, let's have Elizabeth come off mute and ask her questions. Hi, good evening. I don't so much have a question. My name's Elizabeth and I lived in Burlingame for 40 plus years. Um, I am with Housing for All Burlingame and definitely um, I'm supportive and encouraged by the work that the city is doing and appreciate uh, them listening to our little group. I just would encourage the city to look at um, the huge gap between the very low income and the low income. Um, 50 to 60% of Village for Burlingame, that project has been in the making since 2015. We're still waiting. That is not gonna really make a dent into um, our needs here in Burlingame. Um, and I would encourage uh, to help with housing. You know, Kevin, you did mention there's a lot of projects coming up and that includes jobs, but we need housing to support the people that are coming to have those jobs. So just, just a lot to think about, but I do appreciate you guys um, really considering a lot of what Housing for All Burlingame has had to say. Well, well, thank you, Elizabeth, and I think you're you're giving us a good transition to our um, the notes that we have been taking, and we also want to open it up to additional uh, comments and ideas. Um, so, my colleague Joey has been taking notes on on the questions and what we've heard so far, and um, so now we'll continue to take. So, first, to just give us a little bit of focus, if we could first hear. Your, your issues and concerns. So, you know, what do you want to make sure the city responds and, and to and thinks about in this housing element? Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about solutions. So if you have any ideas, if you have any, we have the map here. Um, 
If there's any lo specific locations you want to talk about, we'll take that. And then after that, we're, we're, we're going to then talk specifically about um, meeting the needs of our vulnerable populations um, and making sure we have housing for people who live and work. So if, so if we can just stay a little bit organized here. And so let's start with some issues and concerns. And I see that Janet has her hand up. So let's take Janet off mute. Great, thank you. Um, this may come up later in the, the conversation, but the Housing Choices works with Burlingame families who have adults and children in the household with developmental disabilities. And currently, um, there's almost no opportunity for us to help those adults with developmental disabilities stay in their home community. Um, and they typically need extremely low income housing. That's the 30% of area median income. Um, area median income in San Mateo County, quite high. Um, and so the rent for a very low income unit is usually out of reach for the folks we serve. Um, so um, we're just very concerned to try to help those folks stay in their home community where they grew up and know people and know shopping and services and bus lines and have a community established um, rather than get them, see them displaced to, you know, the Central Valley or other places. Um, so that's my issue. That's my concern. I know developmental disabilities is one of the special needs populations that you'll be working to um, assess the needs for. And we have a lot of data for you and, and ideas, so we'll send that along. But I did just want to emphasize the need for extremely low income housing for many populations in Burlingame, but especially for those with developmental disabilities. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Janet. So other, other issues and concerns. Now you're welcome to speak. If you wanna speak, you can raise your hand or if you'd prefer, you can just drop it in the chat and Joey will make sure that it goes onto the whiteboard. So um, other, other issues, concerns, ideas that people have. So we've al already gotten um, you know, a lot of important input about taking care of our lowest income residents, very low and low income, and most recent comment about people with disabilities and making sure people can stay in their own community. So other issues, concerns, or ideas? I know, I know we have a small group um, and every idea is important. So uh, please don't be shy. And again, if you, uh, don't want to speak with the group, you can also put it in the chat and we'll make sure that it gets onto the whiteboard. So one thing I'll mention is people mull things over um, and, and what's worth um, really clarifying with, with the general plan and, and with the housing element, both the general plan and this housing element are really the city's plan as much as we kind of point at regional housing needs numbers and, and, and such. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that the general plan was um, prepared in terms of what the community thought was the right amount of growth. And it was not answering to it. It was way more than what the state had told us we needed to provide. And it was um, not really trying to reach a, any target from ABAG or what have you. It was based on looking at land uses, looking at how many numbers come out of, out of the, um, the changes in the land use and seeing is this the right number. And um, coincidentally, that is a number that is very close to what the state ended up asking the city, but um, it's worth making the point that um, the city kind of already came to that conclusion and decided this was the right right size for Burlingame in the future. And, and um, good news is it's, it aligns with our obligations as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, there's a, a question in the chat first, but I think um, John Martos had a hand first. So let's, uh, let's hear John's input. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I, I was thinking about affordable housing. I was thinking about our first responders and our teachers and it, anything is allocated for them so they can afford to live in town as well. I think that's really important. Um, you know, you hear 
stories of our fire department personnel living 50 plus miles away and police, same thing. Um, I think it's important that we give them an opportunity to live in the city, uh, as well as our teachers to attract some really fine teachers to our very fine educational um, establishments here in Burlingame. So that's a thought that I had. I don't know if that's part of the plan or not, but um, I think that's, that's very important. And Kevin, can you speak to, because I think he's, um, the, the characteristics of the workers he's talking about are covered in that general workforce housing category. Could you say a little bit more about what the city is, is thinking about to meet their needs? Sure. So there's a couple of aspects. On the one hand, um, we do have a prioritization with the affordable units that are coming online and uh, teachers and civil servants and firefighters and, and those that are employed locally are in the kind of top of the top of the list. Uh, we do want to be careful that we're still offering a fair housing opportunity, but um, we are allowed to do some prioritizations such as that. Um, and then also, um, I, I don't think it's a secret, the school district has been thinking about maybe developing some housing on its own, which would address um, perhaps they would have a, um, I think they see a need to provide some housing for teachers. And then the city has also been thinking about it for city employees and one of our outreach efforts, which we just rolled out this afternoon, as a matter of fact, was an email to all city employees just asking their thoughts on if the city had housing available, would you want to take us up on that? And um, I think that helps us uh, inform future decisions. And, and uh, you know, one thing we've looked at is City Hall is getting pretty old and uh, needs to be uh, rebuilt. And maybe that would include some housing as well um, for city city employees and such. So, um, but it's, it's definitely, that's part of the needs uh, assessment for the housing element and also helps us build some policies and priorities. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, there's a question about creating housing on the other side of 101, which some other cities are doing. Um, is that not appropriate or feasible in Burlingame? I can maybe take a step at that one. So every couple of years, it does, it does come up, different types of developments on the other side of 101, uh, housing being one of them. I think some of the challenges we run into with um, allowing housing on that side of the freeway is that, um, you know, we need the right support services uh, to provide support for residential uses, namely uh, fire department, police, uh, uh, other support services like grocery stores, um, you know, things that, that you would want to see in a neighborhood or that, um, you know, where public services can be also offered to residential uses. So that's one of the challenges is that we don't have any of those types of support services on that side of 101. Um, but, you know, it certainly does come up every, every so often and, and uh, we may need to, to take a look at that. Kevin, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that. Sure, I would say uh, we did look at this as part of the general plan, and um, there was some interest. And so, as as you mentioned, every few years it, it uh, is is discussed. Uh, there was some concern when we looked at the general plan that if if it wasn't planned in such a way, we could just have these kind of random apartment complexes just in the middle of nothing. Um, so maybe there were, it would apply to just one part of the bayfront. Um, there were some concerns over, does the city have a strategy for sea level rise? And at this point we do, um, or we're, we're definitely getting one um, coming into focus very quickly. Um, so that, that is a change from when we uh, first discussed this a few years ago. Um, so it's not to say it's not on the table. It's not um, something we would need to do in order to meet the, the numbers in terms of, of the obligations and for the reasons Ruben mentioned, it um, it was not considered a priority, but um, this is an opportunity to uh, look at look at ideas. And if that was something the community was interested in exploring, um, we can report that uh, as well. Okay, thanks, Kevin. 
So we have a comment from a landlord who has decided to keep her rents affordable for her tenants. Can you speak to any incentives to owners of units to keep their units affordable? And um, I'm wondering if this is, this might be, is this coming into a, a program or strategy for, um, you know, affordable housing for either workforce or meeting the overall affordable housing needs? So any incentive this, programs? This is something we're very interested in. Uh, I don't think, um, I think we're looking at incentive programs and trying really hard. And, and in fact, I would, you know, I'd be uh, quite interested to, um, we're doing some stakeholder meetings and, and um, we'd be very interested to, to talk to uh, Ms. Urbina um, to get a sense of what kind of incentives might be helpful because this is a question we're trying to answer. And um, as mentioned, there's, uh, the city is starting to accumulate some financial resources that might help in creating some incentives, but we really want them to be effective. So um, I would encourage, I'm gonna put my uh, email in the chat and um, anyone in this meeting, of course, you're welcome to contact me, but um, we do wanna hear from stakeholders and, and such and um, work together to, to find things that might work. Okay, great. Well, hopefully that connection will be made. So um, yeah, if you want to reach out to Kevin, contact him directly, and he can include you in the outreach opportunities for those conversations. Um, so other, other thoughts or ideas? And we have some information in the chat from our, our planning commissioner about Rollins Road and the housing units and uh, Ruben or Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything there, um, but thank you I, for that additional information. Yeah, I would say, and that kind of um, council member Brownrigg really nicely summarizes, that was the conclusion with the uh, general plan was there's some great areas to focus on right now. Let's work on those. And in particular, the Rollins Road, that that area really captured people's imaginations in ways, you know, I don't think we expected when we started the process. And um, we really were excited that the the plan that's been put together is, is it's really cool. I mean, I just got to say it. Um, and um, so we want to make that work. Um, I tend to think, and this is just, you know, me thinking of, as a planner, um, you know, the Bayfront could be a great opportunity in the future or other parts of the city. Um, Cause they're, you know, if we, if we decide if the community does decide that there's a need for more housing, but um, for now there's, there do seem to be really good opportunities in these well-located more central neighborhoods that are close to transit and services and, and um, are kind of really ready to go for, uh, for creating these mixed use neighborhoods. Okay, great. Thanks for that um, additional information. Uh, so we have a comment that it's great that we're reaching the RENA allotment. Are we ready for potential increases since the state auditor found HCD underestimated housing needs? So do you think that number is going to hold or do we have a buffer built in? Um, how is the city kind of anticipating any changes to that number? Um, I will admit I'm not exactly sure what's what's gone on with <laughs> HCD in terms of, of, of that. Uh, what we do know is is a good rule of thumb for preparing the housing element is to um, is to uh, plan for more units than what is the requirement in that that gives you some some wiggle room. Um, so, um, and, and you'll hear some, you know, some of the other communities around us, I think Redwood City have mentioned that they're going to try to exceed their allocation by a substantial amount um, as a just in case. Um, it could also be, again, a community choice, as, as mentioned, the, the general plan is more a reflection of, of what the community wanted to do in terms of growth, and um, that's still the community's choice. So. Um, as of now, our marching orders are the 3,257, but um, of course we uh, will continue to um, listen to uh, whatever uh, obligations come our way. Okay, thank you. And HCD, uh, for those who don't know all the acronyms, real 
at the tip of their fingers? It is the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and it is a state agency. It's um, and it's just to kind of work, you know, to give the big picture. Um, the the state looks at the whole state and says, how many housing units do we think we need in the next eight years? And then it allocates them by region. So Southern California, Central California, Bay Area, San Diego, uh, Northern California. And then within those areas, it gets allocated further down. So it's kind of, we're all in this together and the numbers are, you know, there's all kinds of methodology and such. Um, and, and that may be what the, um, the uh, um, chat was, was uh, getting to is, is uh, there, there's been lots of discussion of those methodologies and what they're really meant to reflect is the economic growth, the employment and the opportunities um, for housing um, and, and particularly housing in places that um, maybe already have a lot of good things going for them. Um, so that's that's kind of the big picture, and then that's that's how what starts at the state comes down to the local level level with the number of units that we are trying to plan for. Okay, and Kevin, we have a a comment that references SB nine. Um, we don't know what the implications are for new housing, but it's, it's essentially significantly increases the potential for new housing. For those unfamiliar with SB9, could you say a little bit about that and, you know, how the city is anticipating responding to that uh, legal requirement? Certainly. So SB9 is Senate Bill 9 and, uh, excuse me, it was um, passed by the legislature last year. And what it does is it allows um, two unit buildings or duplexes within any single family zoned or R1 district. So uh, if you see our little map there in the corner, uh, the areas where we have all the little houses and trees that um, we said generally people wanted it to stay pretty much the same. Um, those are the R1 districts and, and um, there are some other districts in there as well, but. Um, the intent of the legislation is to allow, um, whereas somebody may want to build a single family house or, or there's an existing single family house, uh, they could instead build a duplex. And a duplex being, it could either be one building with two units, either above each other and below each other or side by side or even next to each other as two little cottages. Um, and then there would also be an ability to split that lot in half in order to build um, duplexes. So in total, there could be maybe four new units um, on uh, a property that was originally for one unit. Uh, the city has put together some regulations that are in place and uh, the approach we took was to mirror the single family look and feel and the, the building form in terms of building height and setbacks and basically the size of the building and say, it could either be a really big house or it could be two units or it could be four, you know, whatever you fit within that, that envelope, it's still gonna look like a house. Um, and that was something we, we thought was very important. Um, so that it, there is an opportunity for providing more units that way. Um, it's a new piece of legislation, so it's untested. We don't really know how much response th there will be. So for this housing element, um, we're really not factoring a lot of those units in. And in fact, um, HCD, which we just mentioned, the Housing Community Development um, Department, is also sort of reserving judgment for now and not really encouraging jurisdictions to anticipate um, huge numbers of, of these duplex projects just because we don't know how well it'll go. Um, Next housing cycle, I, my guess is we'll have a better sense of, of how many of these are actually being built. Um, I think another um, piece of this puzzle are accessory dwelling units. And that's something we do, we do know more about. Accessory dwelling units are um, generally, they've been known as second units, granny flats, backyard cottages. Um, it, it's basically a little unit behind a house or next to a house or attached to a house. Um, those we have a much longer track record and we know how many units the city has looked at every, every year. So for that, for this housing element, we can 
make a educated guess that based on past years and where we're at now, we can imagine X number of, of accessory dwelling units uh, over the next eight years. Uh, with the SB9 duplexes, it's a little harder to do that because we just we don't have a track record. It's um, unclear uh, how many we may actually get um, for disclosure. So far, there are no applications on file. So um, we're still in the wait and see mode um, with, with the, that particular program. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just want to, um, you know, we have, we've generated, we're a small group that's generated a lot of ideas and some excellent questions. So we want to take the opportunity to get your ideas. Um, uh, you know, so the housing element, it looks at sites. So where do we locate the housing in our plan? But it also looks at programs and policies. And these are programs that either help remove barriers to housing being built, or there are things to make it easier for um, people to retain their housing or to find housing options, especially as it relates to vulnerable populations. So, you know, we started out with an idea. Um, someone had a question about an incentive program for landowners. So, you know, you got us off to a good start with a program idea. Um, and we also had some comments about you know, making sure we had programs that created opportunities for adults with developmental disabilities to remain in their homes. And in the chat, there were some ideas shared there as well. Um, so what other, any program ideas that people have? And it could be something from, um, you know, maybe another community you visited or just an idea you have. Um, so we'll give you a chance to think. And in the meantime, um, John Martos has a question about the timeline. So what's the timeline for building out the new Rollins Road neighborhood? So it's already started, as a matter of fact. Uh, so one thing we did when the general plan was adopted in 2019 is we very quickly put together uh, some interim zoning to allow uh, development to start. There was a lot of interest right out the gate. Um, and I want to emphasize the interim zoning. A lot of care went into that. We had some lengthy meetings with a planning commission subcommittee to make sure that because we knew that it would just be a matter of time and sure enough um, two projects have already been approved um, it's in the hundreds of units i can't recall Five, five 563 <laughs> thank you ruben <laughs> uh, so 563 have already been approved and are either under construction or nearing groundbreaking there's another 400 and either five or 20, depending on uh, some nuances with the development that are already also um, under review. So um, the housing is taking off very quickly and um, could you could see some results um, within the next couple of years. Uh, the bigger pieces of that, uh, there's also as part of the specific plan, there is a streetscape element and, and some you know, more kind of public realm uh, kind of public space, street design, things like that, um, that I would say those are, you know, longer term, not hugely long term, but, you know, maybe in the 10 year time frame. Um, but I think I would expect that 10 years from now, um, there'll be a lot of really positive changes um, that we'll see in terms of new housing, new businesses, um, hopefully a great streetscape and, and bike lanes and all kinds of stuff um, without, uh, without too much delay. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so let's see. Um, what are your your program ideas? So, uh, you know, just thinking about um, some of the people we want to make sure we take care of in our community. Um, we have seniors who want to be able to age in place. Uh, we also have seniors who they may have a big uh, a home that's too big for them now. Um, but they want to make sure that they can find a place in their own community. They want to stay. Um, they want to stay where they've lived their whole life. Um, thinking about any uh, programs that could help low-income residents or activities that would support families with children and, again, people with disabilities. So we want to make sure we pay attention to our special populations. Uh, we have a hand up from Janet. So um, Janet, we'll take you off mute, and we'd love to get your program ideas. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I have some ideas I'll just put out there and hopefully I can be clear about them. Um, it sounds like the village at Burlingame was a great use of public land for affordable housing. Um, um, playing on that, I would just add that I think the housing element should be clear that the city will use public land and any city housing funds, for example, the money that you're generating from your linkage fees, that you'll prioritize the, the most underserved communities in selecting developers. So I think that's a way to prioritize and incentivize developers to reach your goals mm -hmm. um, by making land and dollars available competitively and scoring the responses based on how well they respond to the most difficult to serve households. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty obvious, but it, it's something that you should definitely focus on. And I would of course say extremely low income people with disabilities, but seniors on fixed incomes, um, other people who are, are threatened to, uh, with being displaced from Burlingame. Um, and so that allows developers to tell you the best that they can do in meeting that need, and then you can choose the best proposal. Um, and then the other um, idea I wanted to put out there is, um, first of all, the work that you're doing to preserve existing, naturally occurring affordable housing is so awesome. And um, it's great because, you know, it's preserving your history, right? So many communities are just being wholesale, they look completely differently than they did 20 years ago. So um, I don't know what would be an effective incentive to get that housing preserved, but I do know that there are some models where cities have provided funds to affordable housing developers to step in when that housing was on the market and try to preserve it. Um, so if the incentives to existing owners doesn't work, then think about making dollars available to affordable housing developers to step in and buy that housing. And third, I just wanted to say that um, ADUs are a great option for people with developmental disabilities. Um, and what would be really important is if the city could figure a way to use city dollars to get some accessory dwelling units that were affordable down at that extremely low income level. Um, so you could provide, you know, $50,000 or whatever, and the condition that the homeowner rent it to an extremely low income person for a certain number of years. Um, so I hope you'll think about that as well. Um, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet, those for some excellent ideas to be considered by the team. Um, so who, let's see, what other ideas do we have? And again, you can drop them in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'd love to hear your ideas. While you're thinking about that, I also wanted to recognize council member Donna Colson, who's also with us this evening. So thank you, Donna, for being here. Okay, welcome, Donna. Okay, so... Uh, while you're thinking, and you know, we won't we won't be labor thinks. We'll just give you a few moments to collect your thoughts. Um, so we've gotten um, a sense of some of the issues, concerns, and ideas from the people who are attending here tonight. Um, a number of comments about making sure that we pay attention to the needs of the very low and extremely low income populations. Um, the city has made some progress in some areas. Um, and has shared some of that. Um, also looking for an emphasis on meeting the needs of teachers and first responders and others in our workforce housing uh, qualified folks. Um, and, and a variety of questions um, and then also some ideas. So thinking about how we can provide incentives. So um, definitely a carrot approach. Um, so connecting with landowners and maybe they can help uh, agree to rent at affordable rates, um, provide incentives as Janet was just explaining, some incentives to affordable housing developers to uh, compete and and provide the best solution to meet the needs of a population that can be very difficult to find housing for. 
Um, uh, mention about ADUs again as another option. Um, so we just want to make sure we don't miss anything. So any other comments or questions? And uh, we've, we've had the opportunity to speak throughout the meeting tonight, but if there's anyone who would like to make public comment, we did want to make sure that we had time set aside to make sure people could make verbal comments. So if anyone would just like to speak and make a uh, public comment, we're happy to take that. So please raise your hand if you'd like to do that. Okay. So then with that, I'm going to take us back to our slides. And okay, so still no one for public comment. So we're going to wrap that up. Um, we do have some upcoming outreach opportunities. So uh, Saturday, um, on the 26th, we'll be on Broadway, um, probably near the market, um, between around 11 and 1 lunchtime to reach as many people as we can. And we just have um, a short poster board activity so that we can get input from people. So uh, if, if you're there, please feel free to drop by and make additional comments. Um, there is an um, additional a second community meeting and we'll be a little bit further along in some of the work that has been done. We'll be sharing that and that's going to be on April 6th. So that's going to be on Zoom as well. And then um, Kevin and his team will be going to the a joint meeting of the City Council and Planning Commission to give a more in-depth presentation on the housing element. And Kevin, is that a, like a special work session? It's it's pretty lengthy, so uh, definitely a lot of time put into it. It's annual, and I'll say this will be one of probably two items on the agenda, so um, it's, uh, there's certainly, you know, three hours worth of things to talk about with housing, but uh, there will be something else as well. Um, and one thing, we're um, determining whether it will be on Zoom or in person, um, and that has to do with, um, you know, governor's orders, things like that. Uh, we like Zoom because it is way to, it is very convenient and people can uh, join the meeting at their convenience. Um, but we also, uh, it will provide more information as the date reaches in terms of um, how to be involved with that. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And the city has set up a page, um, go to burlingame.org, departments, planning, housing element. And if you just Google Burlingame housing element, it'll take you right there. And uh, that's a good portal for information related to the planning process and the different outreach activities. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, the, e the web link has been dropped in the chat. So feel free to grab that and copy it. Um, but I think with that, we have, we've achieved our objectives. We've got some excellent input from our group tonight. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Kevin for some final remarks. Well, thank you. Um, we really appreciate these comments and, and I personally love when it's, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's great when it's a small group because we can just talk. And um, there were some really great constructive comments and, and really good questions. Um, and this is the kind of thing we want to hear from the community. Um, if you think of things after this meeting, which I know always happens to me, um, you can either contact us through, uh, I put my own email on there. Uh, as Joan mentioned, we have a pop-up on Saturday on Broadway. Uh, great opportunity for you to uh, check out Broadway and, and um, share your more ideas. And then we'll have another workshop uh, in, in April as well as our joint meeting. Um, so thank you all. Um, this is really helpful. We appreciate the council members also attending and, and, um, and, and knowing how important housing is to the city council. Uh, so appreciate that as well. Okay, so with that, we thank you for your time. I really want to thank um, uh, Kevin and Ruben for their presentations and for answering numerous questions. Your participation has been extremely helpful um, and it's greatly appreciated. So with that, we are officially adjourned. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you.